to. Good afternoon. I now call to order the December 13th, 2021 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on agenda on an agenda item. <clears throat> Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie uh, if you must leave the call. You can do so by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be ma maintained. And Ms. Clark, I'd ask now that you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Mr. Offerman? Present. Ms. Scott? Present. Mr. Thomas? Present. Ms. Causey is here. Ms. Clark? Thank you. Thank you. Well, quorum being present, we will begin. Um, Ms. Clark, could you please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Yes, Dr. Boswell McComas? Present. Dr. Monique Waitley Phillip? Dr. Holmes? Present. Mr. Dixit? Present. Dr. Almendorf? Present. Ms. Schubert? Present. Mr. Plate? Present. And Mr. Stoll? Present. Did I miss any staff members? Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also like to um, mention or, or, or make sure we acknowledge any board members who are joining us who are not a part of the committee. Yes, I'm here, Lily Rowe. Thank you. So we'll begin. PRC staff have asked that the new business items be presented first. With that, I will ask Dr. McComas to begin with policy 6400. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm here this evening with my team. Um, air policy up for this evening's uh, review um, is policy 6004 related to magnet programs. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Elmendorf and Ms. Schubert and Mr. Stoll uh, to walk us through the changes. These are um, changes really to bring it in alignment with uh, standards. So, Thank you, um, Dr. McComas. Um, I'm going to turn it over brief um, shortly to um, Ms. Schubert, Mr. Stoll to walk you through some of the changes, but I just want to say as a, my first time through the whole process of a um, policy re revision, just reflect on um, how impressed I was with the amount of collaboration and passion that went into um, dotting all of the I's, crossing all the T's, making sure everything really reflected what is best for our students and their families. And so just really inspired by the work that was done and how obvious it is that um, the, the people working on it really care deeply for our families. With that, I'll hand over to Ms. Schubert. Thank you. So actually, Mr. Stoll is going to walk um, the committee through the proposed uh, policy changes. <laughs> okay, the ball rolls downhill. More like a relay, right? <laughs> there you go. Um, so policy, board policy 6400 is up for review this year. Uh, its last revision was in 2015. And the policy, policy 6400, outlines the board's commitment to educational choices through magnet programs. And there were the, the primary changes to the rule was adding a new paragraph, paragraph two, uh, which is the standards. Mr. Stoll, the board members are only reviewing the policy, not the rule. I'm sorry, did I say rule? I meant policy. My, my, my apologies. Um, so, so for board policy uh, 6400, uh, the change to the policy was the addition of paragraph two, which is the standards. Um, subparagraph 2A is a statement the superintendent will determine how students apply, are selected for, enrolled in, and qualify for magnet programs. And then a subparagraph B, under paragraph two, 
business statement supporting the equity and selection of students for magnet programs. Uh, and it reads, the magnet application admission and assessment process will be used to promote equity in accessing magnet programs. And those were the only changes to the policy. Thank you. Is there an additional, anything additional for presentation? No, that's, that's it. Okay, so we'll open a question up from uh, the floor for questions from board members. Um, I will start first and board members, if you have questions, please um, put your um, name in the chat so I can make sure that I call on you. Um, you said it's under uh, section two standards and um, I want to know because it doesn't say in there, it says the magnet application admission and assessment process will be used to promote equity in accessing magnet programs. Um, is there, a, can you explain, I guess, sort of how will you do that? So the, the process for doing that is specified in superintendent's rule 6400. Um, and, and part of that process is um, how we select students for elementary, middle and high school programs. Um, Elementary and middle school uh, students are selected by random lottery. And for high schools, there's an assessment process for most of our programs, but uh, you know, there are there's no break point where students um, are either qualified or not qualified. That was modified a few years ago, um, but students take an assessment process and then they're selected by random lottery. OK, and I guess uh, should there be something in there that says that references the superintendent rule 6400 that says as per superintendent rule 6400. If I if I may miss uh, Scott, um, all of their policies have those corresponding rules, so I don't know um, and I'll just defer to Miss Howie is do we reference the rule in any of the other policies in that route method? No, what you have in subsection three members of the committee is the implementation section, which indicates that the superintendent is directed by the board to implement the policy. And you also have as related policies, uh, your equity policy. And mm -hmm. perhaps Mr. Stoll can explain some of the evolution uh, of the magnet application process. Um, he and I have been here um, long enough to remember changes in the process. That may help the board committee uh, in understanding how we have gotten to a point where we believe that the process now is much more equitable than previously. Sure, so I don't, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002. Um, prior to that, schools conducted their own admissions process. Uh, we centralized the process in 2002 to make sure that there was more consistency in the admissions process and how students were selected for programs. Um, at that time, and up until about four years ago, um, elementary stu school students were selected by random lottery. Uh, middle school students and high school students had to go through an admissions process and there was a break score or a minimum score um, that students had to achieve in order to even be considered for placement in the magnet program. Um, students who met that were put into a lottery selection process and students who didn't meet that were just were basically not qualified for the program and not offered an opportunity for placement. Um, about four years ago, we modified the admissions process. It would have been five years ago, um, but we modified the admissions process to make it more equitable and, and have more students have the opportunity for placement in our programs. And the way that we did that is we eliminated the admissions criteria for middle schools. So students were selected purely by random lottery. Um, students who expressed an interest in the program had the same opportunity to be placed in the program as any other student. And then at the high school level, we made a tiered admissions process. Um, so students who score 80% or higher in the evaluation process are given first consideration for placement. Um, but as, and then after that, we 
consider students in descending order of their assessment scores. All of the assessment scores are based on 100 points. So after 80, um, 70 students with earning a score of 79 would be considered, then 78, then 77. As long as the student completed the admissions and assessment <laughs> process, um, they basically were included in the lottery selection process and they had an opportunity at some point uh, for placement in the programs if seats allowed. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll open the floor to now. Are there any board members that have questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas. Yeah. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, so deviating from the policy a bit and going and expanding on what you just said, um, Mr. Stoll or Dr. Stoll, sorry. Um, would I, I know that with the high school program priority in the superintendent's rule, it outlines that you know up to 20% of the available seats in a program will first be filled by the applicants who earn a total evaluation score of 80% or higher. Um, my question is, does that mean that uh, for students that can you can you expand on that further just to, to start off? Sure, for for high school programs, uh, the rules do allow us to fill up to 20% of the seats in a program by students who score the highest score on the magnet assessments um, for and that's program specific. So for example, if I have a program that has 20 seats, I can fill four of those prior to the lottery by students who score the highest score on the assessment. Um, if we're able to determine those four top high scoring students and fill those seats. Um, and then after that, it's it's by random lottery. OK, and is it by a random lottery for the students that score 80 percent or higher or at random lottery for every student that applied? So the first group that would be entered in the lottery are the students who scored 80 points or higher. They would be given first opportunity for either placement or be placed on the waiting list once we fill all the seats. And then students in descending order of score are lotteried um, and then they would go next on the list. OK, so just for clarifying one more time, the students that receive 80 percent or higher on that application score would get priority placement. And then once all of those seats are filled, if there are additional seats, then it descends 79, 78, 77. That's correct. Right. OK, and the uh, I'm very familiar with the application process. I go to Eastern Tech, so I, I went through this process back in uh, in in. in, in eighth grade and I also went my brother's going through it right now for middle school when it's all lottery based um, when I applied to a middle school magnet program we were still at the uh, assessment based uh, criteria um what was that nine years ago eight I don't know many many years ago um so I, just for clarification for the other board members the assessment for the uh, application is not just a test and the, the assessment score that we are talking about can you explain maybe what that assessment score looks like Yes, yeah, so the evaluation score is for most schools is made up of several components. Um, for most of our schools, 12 out of the 14 schools where we do a, an evaluation process, there's an academic component where we would look at grades, um, attendance, course enrollment, and students would earn points based on those standards for that, for that particular academic evaluation. And then they go to the school and they take an assessment there and the assessments can vary from paper and pencil tests to performance based assessments. Um, so there's a wide variety of, of types of assessments that's, that schools can use based on the types of programs that they offer. Thank you. Um, and so I guess when we're in the policy, we're saying we want to promote equity with, with this policy, but I think in the current system that we have, for me personally, I think there are some inequities that still exist. For example, um, having, I think, it, the child of an employee, a priority placement for employees in the superintendent's rule that says when an employee's primary work site is a school with a magnet program at, and the employee's child applies to a magnet program in that school, the child will be given priority placement in the magnet program as follows. And I know I go to Eastern Tech, and so I, I've i noticed that there are a lot of students at Eastern Tech whose teachers are also Eastern Tech teachers. And I guess that priority placement there, would that, does that interfere? I mean, if those students were not one of the top 20% scorers uh, that are originally selected, you know, would they possibly take a spot from a student that was one of the top 20% um, 
applicants? So what you're referring to is the priority that's given to employees who work in a particular magnet school. So if their child applies to that, and if we're talking about high school, um, the student also has to earn at least 80% in order to qualify for that priority placement. So um, that's the second priority that's available at the high school. One's based on the assessment scores, the other is an employee priority. And when we're talking about Eastern Tech, for example, they're admitting somewhere in the vicinity of 300 to 320 students. And in a given year, we might have one or two employees that have a child that applies to their program um, who would qualify for that priority placement. So we're not talking about a lot of seats when we're talking about employee priority placements. Um, and it doesn't happen in every school and every program every year. You know, if we get a half a dozen employees who are looking for placement for their children in any given year, that would be a lot. Okay. Um, and also one thing that I've noticed with schools like Eastern Tech and Western Tech is, you know, these are schools that are academically achieving, sometimes ranked in the top 10 Maryland high schools, sometimes ranked number one and number two for BCPS high schools. And I guess a concern that I have is with the 20% of seats available uh, automatically being filled by those highest achieving uh, students, you know, is that promoting equity or is that creating a an advantage for the for those students that are top scoring? I, I think that the 80% uh, that the superintendent's uh, rule saying that 80% are above is valid for admission and then going to a lottery system. But you know, those four students out of the 20 students that you mentioned before, having that advantage just because they scored higher on the overall assessment. I don't, is is that really promoting equity? And then, so is, is my question. I know you got, you are all the professionals on this matter and you've devised this. And so I, I just wanna hear your thoughts maybe on why that decision was made. So just to remind you, Mr. Thomas, uh, and certainly staff is is more than willing to answer your questions. Superintendent's rule is not uh, being voted on by the board at this meeting. We obviously want you to uh, make sure you have an informed decision, uh, but just so you know that the rule is not before you for vote. Okay. So With that, that it's a staff. Okay. I'm sorry. With that, I leave it to staff to okay. respond to your query. If, yeah. if I may, so I will I will share and thank you, um, Ms. Howie, uh, for making sure that we're staying focused on the policy and not litigating the, the role. But what I will share, Mr. Thomas, is that um, first you have to really understand the nature of how our magnet programs came to be. And Mr. Stoll shared a little bit of that background. Our, our programs really it, it developed over a series of decades um, and, and developed in a very inequitable fashion. And so we have been uh, very thoughtfully working towards a more equitable uh, context. And you heard things about uh, going towards a lottery model at the middle school as compared to many moons ago when you yourself um, were applying to middle school. Um, and so our policy is to help us move in that direction uh, to suddenly um, pull the rug out, if you will, under uh, decades old practice um, could be um, detrimental. And so that's why this is really about a thoughtful move towards a more equitable question. You raise excellent questions. Um, and I think our team has been working to create that more equitable playing field of access so that students, for example, who, you know, some students, I'll use dance uh, to me as a really clear example. Uh, we, Fortunately, we have some students who their families have the resources and they've been in dance from the time they were three years old. Um, and yet we also have young people who have not had that um, additional resource. And, and certainly when they get to these programs, we want a child regardless of their level of affluence and resource in their background to give them a both a fair shot at it, not a disadvantaged shot um, one way or the other. And so our team continues to, to move in that direction. Um, part of that process has been to help standardize the assessments that students take. So uh, decades ago, you could have two schools have the same magnet program, but have very different admission assessments. Um, and so we're working to standardize it in that fashion. So I'll let the team add anything else um, to help serve. Sort of, um, you know, I'm very dedicated to our board members having a good understanding um, of where we are in our work moving forward. So. 
Um, so, Mr. Thomas, I also want to thank you for your thoughtful questions. The only thing I would add, um, Dr. Boswell McComas, is several years ago, 2015, we conducted fairly extensive focus groups with parents um, around the school system. Um, I believe we had a total of eight with some blizzards in between with those focus groups. And that priority admission was one of the topics that was discussed in those focus groups. And um, as Dr. McComas indicated, our stakeholders, our families, our students felt strongly about that. Um, um, and I would concur with her. We are working towards um, ensuring that our admission standards really are equitable. Um, and when we talk about our definition for magnet programs, we are looking to provide an opportunity to explore and move away from that notion of students bringing mastery when they come into a program. Thank you. I will just add one more thing. Part of what makes Magnet and this entire discussion really very powerful um, is er there is phenomenal demand among our community for Magnet programs. Year upon year, we have more and more uh, young people who are seeking the opportunity to study in our Magnet programs, and uh, that demand really speaks to um, the need to continuously try to move towards the most equitable access possible so that again regardless of where a student lives regardless of their social economic background regardless of their uh, learning needs or their uh, lang first language uh, needs that we need to continue to move towards uh, equitable practice and standardizing our practice for access thank you it looks like we have a question from Ms. Gauzy good afternoon and thank you for the presentation and the discussion um, I would like to dovetail with Mr. Thomas for a moment. Um, <clears throat> I think it is helpful for the board uh, members in policy review committee, but also the full board when they're considering policies to see uh, the draft copy of the superintendent's rules. Um, because number one, there's a lot that is covered in the rules that then board members don't need to um, uh, discuss whether that needs to be in the policy because it is covered. So. Um, I think that would be helpful. And also, um, in terms of understanding the implementation and then making sure that the policy is um, broad enough to really encompass everything that's that's being handled um, in the superintendent's role. Um, so I appreciate Mr. Thomas's um, discussion and questions. I had a specific question around, I had uh, three specific questions. One, around the appeal process in the um, related, at the end of the policy, it says related policies and it references policy 8340 and 8341, but there's not really a statement in the policy that says, um, you know, that students or parents that have concern about their placement have an opportunity to appeal. And then a link, because we have a very, um, um, up, it's updated and, really thorough appeal manual um, that I think could be an easy link that's included, whether it's included in the related down below or whether there's a statement that's included in the policy to indicate that there is a recourse back to the board um, if people have concerns about the policy being implemented um, with integrity. Uh, so that's just a point of um, discussion and then uh, at the recent Joint Area Education Advisory Council meeting with the board, um, the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council chair spoke to the need for a designated CTE high school uh, on the west side of the county. Um, and I'm wondering how would this policy impact the board's consideration of that request? Or is there another policy that um, more completely speaks to uh, exploring the need for an additional program or even a whole school dedicated um, because that would be then an entire magnet tool. Sure, so I can um, I can touch base on that, uh, Ms. Kazi. So um, thank you for bringing that up. It's very exciting thought uh, to have a West Side um, 
type of center. Um, so I just ask that we as a community keep in mind that not all CTE programs are, are part of magnet programs, just like not all magnet programs are CTE programs, but there is a commingling, if you will, of some. I think Eastern Texas, an example, uh, where we have many um, CTE programs as part of that magnet um, school, but we also have in our neighborhood comprehensive high schools, lots of CTE programs that students don't have to apply for admission to get into. Um, and so it's it's a great question because uh, just as the policies that would bring into place any of any school, you know, just as we are currently as a community uh, working through the creation of the new Northeast Elementary School, the creation of a C, a CTE specific a magnet school or center would have to follow all of those school policies and that programming identifying the instructional programming that goes part of it as part of a new school process uh, would be embedded in that process um, and all the work that would go into identifying the specifics if we were to um, put CTE programs and if that were to be a magnet location that pulled students across um, boundaries, if you will, attendance boundaries. All of that would be part of a, a new school process that we would follow. So and if it were to become a magnet um, program, then the same um, policies, procedures that we use for any other magnet program would then also apply. So OK, I, mm -hmm. OK. Do you know if there's a report that's already generated that includes the uh, number of applicants and then the number that are accepted in terms of um, understanding where are the um, preferences and, and where are we leaving a lot of children without the opportunity to pr pursue something that they may very well be qualified for as well as uh, very interested in. Is there all, I don't wanna have someone create a report, but if there's already a report um, like that, I think that that would be helpful for the board. Um, and then also in some of our policies um, over the last couple of years, we have added a statement about an annual report, the superintendent providing an annual report. Um, and so I think that, that would be helpful and maybe we'll want to consider that um, in this policy, not only for uh, the numbers to find out what are people interested in, what are they qualified for and that sort of thing, and where around the county are we potentially leaving children without an op without an academic opportunity, um, but also in terms of the equity piece. How is it that we are um, really making sure that all children have access? Um, so I would be interested in, in, um, in including that. Um, that's, that's all I had for now, thanks. Thank you. Oh no, I'm sorry, I have one other quick thing. Um, Public Works Recommendation 8-38, it's on page 483. <laughs> um, they speak to aligning global language courses to ensure that students can continue their course of study. And I know that we have um, a magnet elementary school that's French. And then, so I'm curious, um, where is that in the um, investigation of magnet programs moving forward or providing courses knowing that you have a cohort of, of students coming out of these uh, magnet programs. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so um, first I'll just say we as a magnet team do annually um, um, analyze, if you will, Ms. Causey, you know, where our programs are, what is the flow of students that are interested in those programs, where are they going and matriculating, and I think the uh, Global Studies programs one in particular because it was part of our uh, Magnet Schools Assistance uh, Grant, uh, which actually, if I can may put a plug in, we will be presenting on this later this week in Curriculum Committee. Um, so I'm going to, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Costi. Yay, I'll everyone. say yay out loud. <laughs> I had to put a plug in, but, but that is particularly one of the programs that came as a result of that grant opportunity for our children. So um, at that, I'll turn it over to our team to perhaps um, address your question uh, because we are, part of that grant helped us build out some uh, feeder pathways, if you will, because prior to that grant, we only had um, IB at, and Mr. Stoll, correct me if I am in, wrong, um, I think Kenwood High School was our only location. And um, 
so I'll very quickly let the team address that because I know uh, Miss Howie, I don't want to get us too far off because, uh, you know, I'm passionate. We could go on. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't mind, Dr. McComas, I'll, I'll take an attempt. Mr. Stoll will fill in um, the holes that I miss in my response. Um, yes, Ms. Cuzzy, we are aware of that recommendation. I will say for our students at Wellwood who currently have um, an opportunity um, to um, study French as international baccalaureate primary year students, which is a full mouthful for our little ones. Um, currently, there's a there's several opportunities for those students to pursue. There is a world language program at Sudbrook Magnet Middle that they could pursue, um, but also as Dr. McComas referenced, um, we don't necessarily see all of our magnet programs as um, direct linear moves for our students. So the um, IB MYP programs that came on board through the grant and thank you for the plug for Thursday evening. Um, so that would be available at Windsor Mill Middle School um, where students could um, pursue kind of that global perspective, but certainly um, those vertical pathways with all of our programs, world languages included is something that we continue to um, work collaboratively with academics about. Thank, thank you. you. It looks like we have a question from Ms. Rowe. And just before um, Ms. Rowe goes forward, just want to remind um, the committee members and staff, this is a public meeting. So I would ask you to please refrain from having discussions in the chat because the public does not have access to those. Ms. Rowe. Yes, so um, I would like to know when it comes to standards in the um, the B statement where it talks about equity and accessing magnet programs. Is the attempt to make sure that all demographics of students have the opportunity to apply and attend or that the outcome is that. We're trying to make sure that a certain number of students actually are in the program. So like for instance, we have special education students who um, might be twice exceptional, but maybe they can't access the magnet program because there's not services or whatever. So I guess my question is, is this opportunity of access or is it opportunity of outcome in, in actual enrollment? So I will thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, we are working on the equity of access um, and we but we do look at how does that match or not match our system wide demographics and who are those students that um, are not perhaps accessing um, in a in a way that we would hope that they would. Um, and so we have looked at some of our ways of marketing the programs and outreach to the programs. Um, I will ask the team to add to that um, and and provide any greater clarification if if, if needed as needed. So do we do anything as far as um, IEP accommodations when students apply for magnet programs and they're taking these assessments? Do we offer them the accommodations? Yes, we do. That's fantastic. OK, the only other thing I would like to suggest to the committee is that um, I have a suggestion for language for line 30 that I'm going to put in the chat. Um, I think it would be good to add C, the superintendent will to the degree funding and facilities allow provide programs equitably in all planning areas of the county and align program themes within feeder patterns. And that sort of gets into what Ms. Causey was talking about, but that's one thing when the magnet audit was done, I don't know when 2013, um, that was something that was an equity issue outlined in the magnet audit, which is that we have programs that exist in certain parts of the county that are inaccessible to other parts of the county because of the geographic nature of the county. And I think actually articulating this intention in policy would make it clear to the public that you know, funding and facilities can be obstacles, but to the degree possible, the school system is attempting to provide programs in all areas of the county and also to provide a feeder pattern where you can start in middle school and that sets you up for the high school program. So I think that it would be very beneficial to the community and all involved to have that in the policy. I'd have uh, raise a point of order or a question. Ms. Um, uh, I guess it would be for Ms. Howie. Um, is this going into operations? 
that is not really a point of order. That's a question for point of inquiry. Excuse me. Oh, sure. Um, so there's a strong argument to be made that it is a part of operations. Um, the, the question is whether or not it's expressing um, how the board is directing the superintendent's work, not how the board is doing the superintendent's work. Uh, so that would be my question because the way I read it, um, and thank you, Ms. Rowe, for putting it into the chat, um, it seems like it's doing the superintendent's work or directing and telling him what to do and how to do it. So I think that uh, it is valuable in uh, in committee for the committee to tell staff uh, the sorts of themes, the sorts of concepts, the sorts of expectations you have that you, that then the superintendent's responsibility is to carry out. Uh, not about how the superintendent carries them out, but what your expectations are. So if equity for the committee is that there be some sort of review of alignment of programs, then that is what can be expressed. Um, so if that is what the committee is looking for, um, and obviously Ms. Rowe is not a member of the committee, so I'm assuming that a member of the committee will either um, uh, open the discussion in this way or present uh, a different way of reviewing this or tell us exactly what concepts you would like in the policy. That's that's the sort of direction that staff would need so that we craft a policy that speaks to the board's desire and vision for the school systems programs. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I would just say also one, I think that we need to make sure that we stick to the policy because it seems like we are going off of the policy, going into operations and kind of making this a kitchen um, sink sort of um, thing. So. I would ask board members to stay on on the policy. Also, another thing, um, it was said before, uh, Ms. Causey, thank you for mentioning the West Side. Um, however, we want all of our schools to be places of learning and places where children um, can learn and, and get the kinds of programs and supports that they need. Um, so I would say that our role as board members is to ensure that all of our schools are properly funded, staffed, and resourced so that all of our children, because everyone doesn't have an opportunity to go to a magnet program. It shouldn't be where you want to go into a magnet program because your local school is is not good. I know, um, or, or, or the perception is that it's, it's not good or not meeting your needs. So we need to make sure that, yes, we're reviewing magnet schools, magnet programs, but we make sure that our own schools and our um, all of our schools um, are are treated equally and um, and and looked after. So I, I would just ask members to um, to to keep that in mind. Oh, it looks like Ms. Causey, you have a question. Thank you. Um, I would like to I would like to make that motion. I I um, after hearing from um, the discussion earlier and. Um, Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Howie. So I will move um, that we add to line 30, paragraph C, the superintendent will to the degree funding and facilities allow provide programs equitably in all planning areas of the county and align program themes within feeder, feed, feeder patterns. Is there a second? So um, members of the committee, would it be helpful uh, for the committee if staff returned and included conceptually some of the issues that have been discussed in a revised policy? That would be helpful for me. Would it be helpful for others? Um, I am definitely open to that. I'm okay. So uh, staff will return with this policy, understanding that the committee wishes to see um, concepts concerning program alignment uh, mm -hmm. in any future policy language. 
So we do have the um, the motion as uh, crafted by Ms. Rowe and made by uh, Ms. Causey, uh, and we will return uh, to PRC with those refinements with the committee's permission. I'm fine with that. Any other comments or, inf or anything from any other members? Uh, I'm Ms. fine Scott, with that. A comment. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I, I like that uh, a lot. Um, uh, I think that would be great. I just want to, uh, I was going to make this motion um, before Ms. Causey I made her motion, so I wanted to just present this for, for staff to see. I'm not going to make this motion, but I wanted to read it uh, for staff. And it was to move to insert and aligning program themes within Peter, feeder patterns to line 29. And so it would, in essence, do some of the similar things that Ms. Rose and Ms. Causey's motion would have done. Um, but uh, I guess align it to the policy and uh, maybe remove some of the direction for the superintendent and instead what the board as a whole would like to see. Um, but I'm not going to make that motion. Uh, I, I think that Ms. Howley and, and staff would present at the next uh, policy review committee meeting some better language. Maybe what I suggested that would be better. Thank you. We will return and we will uh, expand what is now 1C, uh, give about the board's authority to establish uh, or to abolish magnet programs. So we will work on that language and return to the committee. And thank you for your forbearance. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I also request um, staff evaluate adding um, a sentence about annual reporting to the board on uh, the implementation regarding equity, efficiency, and achievement? something along those lines um, because I think from the discussion there's a number of things that board members would like to know in order to um, understand one how it, the policy is being implemented how it's working for our children and then do those trends show us uh, an opportunity to expand or to renew um, and I know that that's um, all of the work the staff does but to provide that annual opportunity to have that discussion for the board um, and so then I would say and around the that, I don't think that that's something that's something I believe that the superintendent can uh, implement or bring to the board and that would be a discussion for with him. Um, I don't feel that's appropriate for um, the review of policy 6400. Um, the term equity has been thrown around a lot, um, but I believe that's something that the superintendent would um, would present. So, so there's again, other policies. Let, us, let the, the, the staff work understanding that the board wants some sort of mechanism uh, for uh, receiving information about magnet programs. We understand the request from PRC and we'll work accordingly. And we also have an equity committee and that can be presented yeah, yeah. Um, there as well because we have an equity committee where we can um, actually probably do a deeper dive. There was an equity audit that was done, but we're actually moving away from policy 6400, which is what we need to discuss. And we have quite a packed agenda. So um, in the interest of time, I do feel that we should um, move along. Um, Miss, um, do I, I'm sorry, excuse me. Do I need to make a motion or anything or will this just go back to um, the staff? And so can we move on? If it's by consensus, then it will go back to staff and we will come back with uh, refinements as discussed. OK, are there any objections? OK, so then it, I, it, it sounds like it's it's by consensus um, that it will go back to staff and then we will um, move along to our next item. <laughs> because I want to respect everyone's time. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, may Dr. Boswell McComas and her colleagues be excused. Yes, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so the next policy that I have is policy 7300, capital projects funded by private donations and presenting is Dr. Monique Whitley Phillips and Mr. Pete Dixit. Yes, so good evening, members of the um, PRC, as well as other board members and members of Team BCPS. This evening, we are bringing forward policy 7330 for review and update. And joining me tonight are Mr. Pete Dixit. I also believe that Mr. Merrill Plate has joined us as well. And so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to both gentlemen to provide us with an overview and the changes that are recommended. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Wheatley Phillip. My name is Pete Dixit. I'm Executive Director for Facilities Management and Strategic Planning. We are here to present to you Policy 7330, which is for capital projects funded by private donations. Uh, policy uh, 7330 is for review in the school year 21-22. Um, there are changes uh, that have been made to the policy, and I'll go over the changes and then answer any questions you have. In the paragraph 1A, line 12, um, align the policy statement with the board's goal of preparing students for future. Uh, new paragraph 1B includes the authority of the board to approve or reject private donations for capital improvement projects. In paragraph 2A, includes the requirement that all proposals submitted under this policy must align with board goals and comply with board policies, superintendent's rules, and school system procedures. Paragraph 2D requires the superintendent to establish guidelines for project submission requirements criteria for determining the appropriateness of the project and for the approval of the project. And finally, to conform with policy review committees editing conventions. I'd like to acknowledge the help and guidance provided by um, law office. Um, the other policies that have been adopted by other school systems uh, include Harford County, uh, Howard County, Montgomery County and Prince George's County. With that, uh, uh, I'll answer any so, questions you might have. Mr. Dixit and Mr. Plate, it might be helpful for the uh, committee, some of whom have not been through the 7330 process, to just outline the sorts of projects that have been approved uh, through your uh, division and department and then sent on to the board. As I said, some board members, um, particularly, I don't believe Mr. Thomas has been involved in any 7330 approvals, so it still is uh, a rather loose conceptual framework. If you could tighten it up, please. Thank you very much, Ms. Howie. So for the benefit of board members, particularly the new board members, from time to time, we have private entities that express interest in donating funds for making capital improvements. Those funds and those projects are uh, finally approved uh, under this policy by the board. And the purpose of that is that the uh, board gets a chance uh, with the type of donation, purpose of the donation, and, and uh, has the final authority to approve that. Typical projects like Ms. Howey indicated could include um, track replacement, uh, bleacher replacement. Uh, in some cases, uh, there have been uh, uh, site work that has been indicated. And in one case, there's barn improvement and, and on and on. These projects are typically not covered in the maintenance funds that we use under operating budget. And these projects are not included uh, in the capital program. Uh, other ones comes to my mind is electronic sign. That's pretty, uh, pretty popular. Um, we typically cannot include that because of the competing priority in maintenance and capital area. So this is a good source of funds. Uh, a process includes uh, supporting the principal. The request is submitted by the private entity uh, to the principal in a form that is part of the 7330 rule, describes the project and the source of funding and the amount of funding. Our engineering office uh, looks at the design and supports the principal. Principal acts as the project manager with all the consulting help provided by Mr. Plate's team or any other team that might be needed for that project. Ms. Howie, did I cover your request or do I need to add anything else? No, I think you covered it quite uh, quite admirably, Mr. Dixit. Thank you. And thank you, on behalf thank of the committee, thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Um, does anyone have any questions, Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Uh, would the Unity Playground dedication ceremony or the Unity Playground that we had, is that considered one of these private donations and capital projects? Uh, if if my memory serves, serves me right, there was a grant added by some private funding. So a lot of these projects have a hybrid funding source of a grant and private funds. So if there's any private fund involved, uh, we come to board and let them know and seek their approval. So the answer is yes. OK, and would a so I'm having some misinterpretations, I guess, or misunderstanding when, what a private donation would be. Let's say that there was a, a class, a student council at a school that wanted to buy an electronic sign for their school. Would that be considered a private donation because it's not because it, it's the student council at that school or a PTSA or would that be considered private? Yes, it would be. Anything okay. other than in general, other than part of the operating budget or capital funds, if it comes from any private source, a student, community, or any other source, it's private donation. Thank you. And I, I really love the, the added language to this policy, and I think it's very well put together. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, yeah, so if I could ask everybody to put their name in the chat so I can make sure. Please go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. I did have a question. Um, in the policy, is there, um, I don't see a definition for uh, funding and some of the funding that we hear about are different grants and some of it is legislative uh, grants through bonds. Is that correct? Is that are those projects covered under policy 7330? So if it's a grant, it is not private fund, but if the grant is mixed with private funds, then it becomes 7330. So, OK, so if there's a private component as well as a legislative grant or That's some correct. other grant, um, then it goes through this process. That's correct. Um, what if it's just a legislative grant that completely pays for a project? So if it's a grant, then we follow the procedures that that grant requires. And to my knowledge, most of the grant in the end are still approved by the board and by superintendent. Is there a dollar amount that um, indicates or that designates when a grant would come to the board versus uh, a smaller amount that would not come to the board? All grants, to my knowledge, come to the board for approval. OK, and um, I know that recently in well, in June of 2021, uh, there was a project that was approved for um, Hereford High School and um, it was by a community um, organization. And um, my understanding from looking over the documents that were attached to board docs is that the um, principal and the community superintendent had signed off on it in um, September of 2020 and October of 2020, um, respectively. Um, and then the uh, packet came to the board June 8th of 2021. So that's, you know, several months later. So I'm curious, is that a typical timeline or are is there um, a projected timeline in the superintendent's rule? So there, there is no typical timeline for completion of the project. It depends on the complexity and the requirement of the project. Uh, our intent is to make sure that whatever work is done is done in compliance with applicable codes and all the safety uh, requirements. If it takes more time to do it, we do that. Um, uh, some of the projects that you are talking about have issues related to safety, have issues related to uh, total amount of funds that are needed. So we continue to make efforts to get funding from grants and uh, 
and 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 design it and meet all the codes. Uh, if you have any more specific details you need, I can pull it out and share that with you later on. OK, and so I'm um, concerned more in terms of the approval process because that's what the board is involved in. We're not involved in the completion process. That's, uh, you know, the superintendent and staff. Um, and as you mentioned, there's safety issues and those sorts of things. But uh, I was concerned about the approval process um, and then the implementation process uh, when it has to do with legislative funds because there's timing involved uh, in spending funds that are granted by the legislature. Is that, is that true? I mean, could you clarify that a bit for me? So we meet on the timelines that legislative uh, requirements are, timelines of the requirement. Uh, sometimes we have to go back to them to get additional funding, and it may be one of those projects. But if your question is specific to a request or a project, I have to go deeper into it to find out. But in general, I cannot recall any timeline of the grant that we did not meet. And if we ever will or could or did not, we go back to them and let them know that we need additional time and why. OK, so in the in the so excuse me, excuse me, someone was speaking. Yes, I, was I just that? wanted to provide additional information uh, for Ms. Causey, so excuse me. Um, Ms. Causey, you had said that the board's involved in the approval process. You are absolutely positively correct. However, prior to a project being presented, to the board for your final approval, it still has to go through technical reviews. So let's say, for example, that a school wanted a particular kind of sign um, and did not have the um, electrical capability to support the sign that they wanted. Uh, that would still have to be reviewed um, and then uh, possibly revised prior to approval of the final approval of the board. So yes, the board approves and oftentimes it involves the uh, approval and the review by uh, Mr. Dixit staff involves uh, going over the plans with the engineering staff, uh, making sure that the contractors are reputable. Those uh, and those are not processes that um, can be necessarily streamlined in each and every case. So if there are specifics that uh, Mr. Plate or Mr. Dixon has, um, I would open it up to either of them. But yes, you do approve. We want you to approve, and that's why it's your policy to approve. Uh, but in terms of how long they take to get to you, they may take a while to get to you depending on the review. Let's say they, there's been a particular donation and let's say that uh, that donation is not sufficient to cover, then you go through the process again. So it's it's not uh, a lockstep process in the same way as other things. And we're bureaucrats. We love processes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there additional questions? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I thought there was a question from Ms. Rowe. Okay. So if there are no corrections to policy 7330, it is moved forward um, for first reading as presented. The Thank next you. Committee, uh, may Mr. Dixit, uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, and Mr. Plate be excused. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, members colleagues. of the board. Thank you. The next policy is policy 8230, orientation of new board members. Of that, we call on Ms. Howie. Thank you. Good evening, members of the committee. Happy Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we have present, we've uh, completed for your review uh, a draft of policy 8230 based on findings and a recommendation from the public works audit or public works review, excuse me, specifically the review and recommendation 1-10 on page 69 indicated that uh, the board 
uh, that there should be new training for board candidates. Uh, and this was based on input from the board about uh, the inadequacy of the uh, orientation provided and that the superintendent should provide pre-candidate materials uh, for those individuals who are seeking to run for or be appointed to the board. So with that in mind, uh, we've included a policy statement um, concerning what the board's desire is and then um, a requirement that there be pre-candidate materials provided and what some of those subjects could be in those pre-candidate materials. Uh, so those would be about um, ethics, about superintendents' roles and board policies, and about some of the responsibilities that uh, board members have. Uh, we did look at other um, school systems, obviously, and there's no one way uh, in other school systems that uh, candidates uh, or new board members receive orientation. Um, for the most part, however, we did see that when board members are first elected, then that is when they get their orientation. That is not what Public Works recommended, um, but that is what we see for the most part. Uh, Frederick County does provide pre-candidate training so that there is um, some sort of orientation for individuals who seek election to the board. Uh, but again, there's not one consistent way that each and every um, sister LEA provides that training. Uh, so this is um, our response to uh, Public Works. And given that each and every one of you had some sort of orientation, uh, staff is very um, um, anxious to hear what sorts of topics you as board members find helpful or whether or not there is something you wish removed from the list. So with that, I leave it to the committee. Great, thank you for that. It looks like we have a first question from Mr. Offerman. Uh, well, first, let me say I'm really glad that that this I'm really glad that that uh, that this is uh, is coming forth. Uh, as a new board member, I wasn't, uh, uh, and of course I was appointed. I wasn't aware of all the different things that were expected, and and all the options. Uh, I just want to be clear in terms of some of the language of the policy. Uh, if, if if you could help me, uh, at what point or, or uh, when would a potential board member uh, asking to be either elected or or uh, go through the uh, appointment process uh, get uh, get these materials? Would it be? Uh, would it, and I know this is probably operations, but I'm assuming that it would be uh, on uh, on uh, excuse me on on. On uh, hold, hold one second. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming it would be upon any kind of any kind of request. Is that correct? It could be upon request. Uh, there also, um, I believe it was Texas that Ms. Clark found there was simply a link uh, that that particular um, school system, or I'm not recalling if it was the association had so you want to be a board member so that whoever had either filed their certificate of candidacy or filed their application um, to be appointed would be able to access those materials so it can be in that sense self-paced there would not have to be a talking head sort of thing um, and that would that would make it more accessible if you will and quite frankly again for each and every uh, board member who is a member of the committee, um, that it would be helpful for staff to know what is it that you believe would have helped you um, coming onto the board to be a better board member, to be better prepared. Um, is it Open Meetings Act training? Is it Public Information, Information Act training? We did a separate training um, several months after many of you had been appointed and elected about uh, serving on uh, hearing panels uh, for students suspensions and expulsions. 
again, there's there's just quite a lot that you uh, you do as board members, and uh, there are different ways to approach providing those training materials. And I understand Mabe also provides training to new board members. Um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I would certainly like to see uh, a robust. Uh, uh, I, I think a link would be a really good idea, and I think it might take more than just brainstorming today to come up with the with the uh, with a full range of topics that uh, that 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 uh, would be helpful for, uh, for 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 any potential new uh, board member, uh, which would also include the student member, because I think that you know, but, but before you before you get into this, I think you. You know, I think people people should 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 understand the depth and the nature of all the responsibility and and the overall commitment. Thank you for your sure. answer. Surely. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, next is Ms. Rowe. Looks like you have a question. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that I don't see in the language here is I see a lot about pre-candidate for elections. But I don't see how candidates seeking to be appointed will be approached. I imagine if there's a link with all the resources that they could access that too. But I think it's important since we have a hybrid board to have language that also expects that those seeking to be appointed also access and read through the same language. And, and I don't see that. Perhaps I've missed it, but I don't see it. And no, uh, we use the term candidate for both individuals who are seeking election or appointment, but we can certainly make sure that that is um, clarified. So, um, duly noted, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. That's all I had. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank, sorry. Yes, my uh, little mousy thing's moving the wrong way. Okay. Um, thank you for that presentation and for the work. Um, dovetailing with Ms. Rowe, um, we have uh, with the hybrid model, there are four of the, the four appointed members of the board come through the nominating commission. Right. And my understanding is that they are, um, if they choose to be, um, that their application is private. Um, so that the public doesn't necessarily know who is applying through the nominating commission. Um, so I think it is important to put in some language referencing uh, that the superintendent would provide to the nominating commission uh, information for candidates that are coming through that process. Um, because if they want to be anonymous, they're not going to send an email and go, oh, I just want all this information for no reason. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I think is um, would be helpful is on page one, paragraph um, 3A. Mm -hmm. um, the superintendent, as soon as practicable upon appointment and or election to the board, the superintendent shall schedule an orientation session to mm -hmm. appoint new board members to the operations. Um, I would just suggest adding um, the chair of the board in conjunction with the superintendent. Um, so that there's a, um, a joint or orientation. Um, and I also like. That is certainly the, the model that I believe it was St. Mary's actually uh, for St. Mary's. I think it is the board officers who conduct the orientation, not the superintendent. Well, and actually that's a great point, board officers as well. Um, and I liked the. Um, St. Mary's, um, and thank you for putting all of this into the uh, policy analysis, um, where it's also what they will receive. So they'll receive uh, a packet that includes the education article, the annotated code, policies and procedures, administrative manual, uh, current and fiscal year budgets, information on the programs of instruction, information on capital projects, and other materials uh, related to the duties and responsibilities of board members. Um, because that it is a lot of information and um, if they, depending on the timing of the election and the appointment and when they start, it can be as short as um, one month 
So if you can get those big fat binders <laughs> and start reading them um, or a link, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that that would be helpful as well. So am I hearing that the committee wishes um, more specificity as to the content of the training in addition to making sure it's clear that we're talking about uh, both appointees um, and um, those who are seeking election. That's what it sounds like. OK. OK, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I would just say that I, I think uh, uh, paragraph 1B, the added paragraph, um, it states the board further believes that it is important that candidates for board office understand the responsibilities of being a board member prior to election or appointment. And so it did state out election or appointment. Um, but Ms. Causey, I, I agree with what you said about the privacy for an appointment. Appointment, and maybe needing to iron out the details of how that would occur. But I think that goes into operations and where we say the superintendent will provide each board member candidate that um, that might satisfy that. But I, I'm I'm down, or I, I'm interested in possibly having. Uh, you know more specificity there as well um but again you have sure. all gone through board member training i've yeah. been on the other side uh and i've been doing this unfortunately for quite a few decades uh, <laughs> so so sometimes <laughs> there are there are things i assume um, that i should not and um, in order to make sure that this is helpful to individuals who are going to be leading the school system as our board of directors, if you will, what is it that you as board members find helpful, unhelpful, didn't need to know that, um, that's good for a cocktail party, but not for being a member of the board. I mean, what is it, it this, is, this is for the committee, this is your work, and this is um, what will help guide staff to draft something that will be responsive, not only to the public works recommendation, but as well, to help um, folks perhaps make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise have made, either to serve on the board or to say, never mind. Well, I think that a uh, one of the items we could add to a uh, paragraph three, subparagraph B, and like on the bullets one through six, it would be a calendar of the year. Like uh, what what actually occurs during the year? When is the operating budget cycle? When is the capital improvement plan cycle? When are we voting on the actual school year calendar? Having maybe, I think as someone who just joined the board, um, I'm kind of learning as I go when each of these things are occurring throughout the year. And I think that knowing right off about, okay, the operating budget occurs in January, February, March-ish area, I, I would kind of understand, okay, maybe I want these, these ideas that I would have for the board, I can share it hold those until we get into the operating budget and kind of influence that there. Um, also, going to paragraph two, um, Mr. Offerman mentioned that the student member should be included in, included in, in that pre-candidate board materials or involved in this whole process, and I completely agree. And so um, I move to insert to line 24 after the word candidate, including finalists for the student member of the board position. Um, so it would read, the superintendent will provide each board member candidate including finalists for the student member of the board position with information to include board member responsibilities, ethics, policies, and blah, 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 blah. Second, Ms. Causey. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by Ms. Causey and put into the chat. Is there, are there any questions or discussion around um, Mr. Thomas's motion? So my question is, um, you know, hey, why you limit it to the finalists? Sure you, excuse me again, Ms. Calls, if you could make sure that you put your name in the chat so that I can properly call on you um, and then you can speak to um, your question. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is, um, do you want to limit it to the finalists? It's up to the committee. And yeah. again, if anticipated, this is information that resides on the website, um, then to that extent, it's an academic discussion because it would be available for any individual who's interested in serving on the board. And quite frankly, as I'm uh, listening to the discussion, um, I mean, you do better as board members when the public knows what to expect. I remember when Ms. Rowe first started serving on the board, she said, here's what my constituents expect and I tell them XYZ 
So uh, it's perhaps helpful as well to educate members of the public exactly what a Board of Education does so that while the information is primarily for board candidates, whether for student member of the board position, elected position or appointed position, um, I, there is clearly value in making sure that the information is available to a broader audience. Thank you. Are there any other questions to Mr. Thomas's motion? Sorry for the delay. I'd just like to give it some time <laughs> in case so I can make sure I read the chat. Mr. Thomas, did you want to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Causey, my intent for using the word finalist uh, was similar to the appointment process in kind of the way that that occurs. Uh, there's a long process with uh, the uh, a lot of components that are not public knowledge in, in, in terms of who's applying to be uh, the student member of the board. Um, so that's kind of why I chose the word finalist. Something that I'd like to see broader uh, with the pre-candidate board materials mm -hmm. um, is that there's some type of like meeting that that is actually occurring with the maybe some of the with candidates and maybe the board chair or the vice chair or maybe the superintendent uh, to maybe discuss these things further. I know that in uh, I mean, elections not in the physical are and the capacity of a board member like that I've had on a school based level. Those meetings have been very insightful to those rules. Um, but I just wanted to share that I don't know what the thoughts on the, the committee are like a town hall. Yeah, I, I Ms. Cosby put in the channel. The public can't see that a possibility of maybe a town hall that discusses this further. And I, I think that would be something that could be very beneficial to, to candidates and, and and especially for a student member of the boards uh, who are coming in without some of the public, without some of the knowledge that the public might have about the position. So, uh, I, uh, and I understand the the desire to have it as broad as possible, but remember, student members of the board is that's annual. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas for um, elected and appointed members, you're talking every four years, so the cycle is not going to track in that way. You won't be doing all of your candidates at one time if you're talking about some sort of exchange. Um, so that that just want to make sure you're aware that um, that is not something that is going to happen for student members of the board every uh, year in the same way. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. That that's um, I think that's an important clarification. I hadn't thought about that. So and again, Mr. Thomas, um, Staff is, I mean, this is the board's policy. Uh, staff wants to make sure that this is, that the information is provided is helpful. So what is it, what sort of questions would you have had, would you have liked to have been answered? Um, either to say, wait a minute, I don't think I want to continue to be a candidate, <laughs> or wait a minute, I really want to be a candidate now that I know X, Y, or Z. So that, I, I see that as being how the orientation um, is made more helpful, unlike, let's say, you know, orientation to a new school. Like, here are your lockers. Uh, this is something different. Thank you. you no know, more than finding lockers. <laughs> Thank you for that, Miss Howie. Finding lockers is pretty important, though. <laughs> State school. Uh, um, is there any more, any other questions or um, or additional um, information on Mr. Thomas's motion? OK, um, so um, so uh, if we could do a roll call vote of Mr. Thomas's motion, which I will repeat, I move to insert to line 24 after candidate, including finalists for the student member of the board. It was seconded by Ms. Causey. Um, if all um, who are in favor, answer yes. If you're opposed, answer no. And if you're not ready, um, you will be called again after the roll call vote has been completed. So, Ms. Clark, um, could you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Scott. Yes. Four in favor. Great. Thank you for that. And the motion carries. Um, so, does yes. the committee wish this to? go forward as with the amendment or are there other changes that the committee wish to see to look at this again? Just want to make sure staff is clear that 
in terms of content uh, with the amendment that this is the policy that the committee is pleased to send forward. Um, so, and again, I, I want committee members to say, it sounds though as if we are wanting it to go forward with the, um, with, uh, as amended, with the change. Okay. So, um, but please correct me if there's anyone who is in opposition to that. Um, please let me know. Okay. Um, uh, was that Mr. Thomas? Yes. Okay, so I, 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 if this goes forward, I wanted to go forward with that change, obviously. Um, but I do think there are some there. I, I had mentioned oh, a calendar of the year. Uh, as, oh, sorry, my dog. I had mentioned, no worries. One second. <laughs> it's an edge of member of the board. <laughs> We're dog people. No worries. Um, <laughs> I'm back. Sorry. Um, so I had mentioned a possible calendar of the year that uh, board member candidates could receive that explains you know, when the operating budget capital budget is. And I also was wondering if we could explicitly outline the distinction between um, uh, the distinction between operating and governance to the uh, numbers that were that were on outlined in the policy. Um, because I think that, you know, when I was becoming a member running for board of education, I was campaigning with students saying that I want to I want to rewrite our curriculum to be like this and like that and do this when that is not necessarily in the purview of the board. And so I think that maybe candidates, if they would find more value to having an understanding of the difference between governance and operations when they're running for the position or being appointed to the position so they can know if they really want to be on the board of education or if they maybe want to serve in central office somehow working on uh, to make our system a better place in that capacity. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, and I would like to speak to this. I, I, I would say that um, I agree there should be something that should speak to the difference, um, not only for, for students who may be considering running for the board, but for adults who are wanting to be on the board, the difference between operation and governance and the role of a board member, because I don't feel that that is clear. Um, and it, it I feel that that training and you're right, the um, efficiency review um, did, I believe it did state that um, there was not a clear distinction and understanding of the difference between operations and governance. And so that would be my recommendation uh, that that could not be said enough. Thank you. So it looks like there's a question from Ms. Um, Ms. Rowe. Yes, I just wanted to say, I hear um, Ms. Howie asking for um, suggestions and I would like to make a bunch of those suggestions but I would not like to take up the committee's time doing it um, so if Miss Howie um, if you'd like to engage me at some point offline but there is one thing that I do think would be extremely helpful that I think even the public needs to hear people do not understand that when you come on to the Board of Education because of our quasi judicial authority you are not going to have the same liberty that a county council member or someone else might have to disclose to the public. And I think that the public is very easily confused about what the Board of Education is and, be, and how that quasi judicial authority limits our activities as elected and appointed members in such a way that other elected officials do not have those limitations. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, so I, I believe there was a discussion earlier about adding language around uh, providing information um, for those candidates coming through the nominating commission. So whether it's coordination with the nominating commission, um, even if it's to let them know, provide uh, materials, if it's all on a link, you know, where they could include that in, in their information. Um, the other thing that I saw um, in another uh, district's policy that I think is important is that the Board of Education will make funding available for any reasonable costs associated with the MAB orientation sessions um, consistent with their policy. And that is for new members when they are either elected or appointed. 
um, <clears throat> that wouldn't be for candidates. Um, and I think that that's important because, again, there may be a, a time gap between the election and uh, when they're actually on the board, but they could be um, taking advantage of that training ahead of time. Um, and, and we do have in section C as in CAT, um, line 14, page two, all new members are strongly encouraged to attend workshops for new board members conducted by MABE and NSBA. Yes. Jump. Should I make a motion to just put it in the chat? So I'm. Um, or you just want to make a note and bring it back if there's consensus. So is your is your request to include that there will also be funding for uh, what is already in the policy? Yes. And I and you mentioned um, May and the commission, but um, there is um, the commission page has candidate information and so does May. So I guess I'm not sure you're it sounds like what you're asking for is May training. Um, I think it's I think if I understood Ms. Causey correctly, please correct I'm, me if I'm yeah. um, mistaken, was that her request is for training for once individuals are either appointed or elected not for the candidate um, training. That's correct. Thank you, Ms. Howie. But my question would be, MAVE has new, has new member training. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that in addition to the new member training, you want um, BCPS or, or the board to provide additional new member training? I don't know. The, the MAVE training costs money and if a a elected member or an appointed member um, is has the time to go to that training ahead that it would make sense to have the Board of Education pay for it so that they're so that everyone has access to it. Um, and if they can have access to it sooner before they're sworn in, I think that that's going to be more helpful for that board member, but the board as a whole and the school system as a whole. OK, and but doesn't I'm sorry because I just I don't understand because it's not clear, but um, uh, doesn't the board already pay for that new member training? After they're sworn in. So what you're OK, so what you're saying is, is for the board to pay for the new member training prior to being sworn in. Yes, and the new member training at May. Yes. But it would be for individuals who've already been elected, just not sworn in. Okay, yes, understood. Elected, just not sworn in. But it's also contingent upon when may will have that training. Mm -hmm. Yes. So again, it goes back to Mabe and their schedule and when they'll have the training of which we have no control over. Yes, but they it seems that with the different cycles of different districts that they are trying to be very accommodating in having training available multiple times so okay so i just want to summarize to make sure i understand the committee's request um so ms causey is asking that um the uh the made training that there be language that includes uh board funding uh mr thomas is asking that uh as part of the look fors in the training um, in subsection three, that we include some sort of calendar of um, what occurs during the school year, specifically the operating and capital budgets, uh, their approval, and I'm presuming hearings as well. Uh, and then um, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Scott have asked about um, ensuring that operations versus governance is covered in any training. Ms. Rowe has indicated um, that uh, the outlining the board's quasi judicial authority uh, and the uh, limitations that uh, the board has on acting, that that also be included in the training. And uh, just one right. more question because I, I want to make sure we're, we're, we're clear. Um, uh, I don't know that board members have been trained prior to swearing in because my question, this would be legal. Um, is it official? I, my understanding is that it's not official until you take the oath of office. 
So would it be OK to train board members prior to them um, or would may provide that training prior to board members taking their oath of office? I think they do it if you paid for it. OK, and that would be my question. Yeah, if you could. If, um, I think it um, would. I'm, I'm happy to follow up with me. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that would just be my question because I sure I know there's certain things. OK, great. OK, so um, is it the committee's pleasure that we return to the committee with these refinements and with your permission as well? What I would like to do is at least to have some sort since we have a, you know, the the cap on operating budget or the operating budget hearings coming up, uh, at least provide um, some sort of um, fuller template about what that training would look like while it is something that is done by um, as far as public works is concerned by the superintendent and by yours truly. Again, I'm still inviting, <laughs> inviting, inviting uh, input uh, from you as board members who have been trained uh, as to what uh, what you find helpful, particularly given the fact that the finding was that the training and the orientation were inadequate. So um, I, I would like to bring not only this back, but um, a template for what is going to be provided as well. I would agree. I think that's appropriate. Um, any comments or any um, any board members that would disagree with that? Mr. Thomas? Yes, I do not disagree. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something that no. I said earlier that I might not have stated correctly. For sure. the distinction of uh, governance and operations, I would like that to be included in the new board member orientation, but also in the pre-candidate board materials. Yes. Okay, that was thank you. Yes, sir. Thank but you, Ms. Hodgson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. okay. Great. Right, All right. You. We'll return. We'll return. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so we're going to, that's going. Sorry. Just You'll be seeing it again. Okay. Great. So now um, we can move on. It looks yes. like to policy. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Yes, policy 8500 board okay. self evaluation. And again, that is Ms. Howie. So, members of the committee, policy 8500 is being brought to you uh, because it is on your annual cycle, and this is the year it is slated for review. Um, as well as sort of a harmonic convergence, uh, there was a finding uh, in the public works review about the, the board self-assessment process. And the, uh, the specific finding, which is found on page 72, was that the board should update its self-assessment instrument to include metrics and conduct an assessment yearly. Um, so what we have done is tried to include some of those specifics in the policy. So you'll find a completely new section two, which outlines the evaluative process for the board self-assessment. It's on a fairly tight schedule. Again, this is uh, presented to you for your discussion uh, as a response to what Public Works has recommended. So in June, the board at that point updates its assessment instrument and includes those those areas that you believe uh, should be evaluated. Then in July, the board actually conducts the self-assessment uh, with the metrics that the board itself has chosen and the instrument that the board itself has chosen. Then August of each school year, what the board does at that point is uh, set forth a plan as to how it will address its deficiencies. And then again, to make sure that there is some sort of um, rigor uh, for the board based on the, the finding that there be some sort of quarterly review or some sort of review, I should say, that is done during the year so you're not hit every year with your June, July, August timeframe, but that you look back at your metrics and your progress towards reaching those goals at least quarterly. Again, this is a timeline that is suggested by staff based upon the um, based upon what was in the public works recommendation. 
you'll see that there are several other um, school systems and several other, other local boards of education that have self-assessment and self-evaluation policies. None of those policies indicates that other than um, the, the bare minimum that the board will conduct a self-assessment. And that's pretty much it. There are, um, there's no more specificity in any other board policy um, that was an exemplar. So I do not want the committee to think that this is based on a particular um, board's uh, example. Uh, this is again something that is done in response to um, what Public Works noted as a finding. There is no pride of authorship in this. So if there's another schedule or another cycle, or if there's something um, altogether new that the committee believes is responsive, the floor is open. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Looks like we have a question for Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott, and thank you, Ms. Howie, for explaining that. Um, my, lo my large concern with this timeline is that the student member of the board's term ends on June 31st, and so the student member of the board would not be able to participate in the self-evaluation and self-assessment of the board unless the newly sworn in student member of the board wanted to participate, but they wouldn't have the opportunity to be a board member for that entire year to sure. reflect on that. So I, I would just suggest that maybe we tweak the timeline to say uh, either May, June and July or August or, or April, May and June. Um, it says no later than August of each year. And so I think that if it said um, the uh, May, June and July, then the student member of the board could still participate in the uh, creating and publishing the, the self-evaluation deficiencies addressing um, for the next year. Um, and I, I, I think that uh, June would be an appropriate time to do the self-evaluation because that is the time when the school year is ending sure. um, around the time. So mm -hmm. thank you. Sure. Thank you. Next is Ms. Causey. Thank you um, and thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas for pointing that out about the student member of the board because that I think is very important. So I'm certainly open to uh, staff reviewing the dates and the timelines. Um, <clears throat> so that's number one. And then the next thing is on um, the policy analysis. Um, Allegheny County Board of Education, they have 10 items um, that are the specific areas um, where they're going to um, establish realistic objectives related to board procedures and relationships, and then they're going to measure its performance against the stated objectives. And the following areas of board operations and relationships are representative of those in which objectives may be set and progress appraised. Um, one, board member orientation and continuing development. Two is board meetings. Three is fiscal management. Four is board community relations and communications. Five is board superintendent relations. Six is instructional management. Seven, planning and goal setting. Eight is board and staff relations. Nine is legislative leadership and 10 is policy making. And I think um, all of those are, are very important areas and there's also metrics that could be attached in terms of board meetings, attendance, um, you know, committee member, um, committee meeting attendance. Board Community Relations and Communications. We heard, for, heard just from our Area Education Advisory Council chairs and um, the coordinator um, that they would like to see more board members attending those council meetings and maybe even to have a rotating basis. Um, and so those sorts of things in terms of um, board community relations and communications. Mm -hmm. So I, I would ask to consider the, uh, those being part of the specification. So all of those areas, or were there some of them you didn't want, or you want all 10? All 10. <laughs> the students get measured, right? We we can be measured and see how uh, that we're continually improving and uh, doing the best that we can. OK, so we can definitely include that in um, subsection 2a uh, to include metrics as determined by the board in the following areas and then to include those 10. 
Does that meet the committee's request? I believe it does. Um, oh, it looked like there was a comment from Ms. Rowe. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think um, added to that, the board now has our new civility agreement that we put together and approved. Mm -hmm. And I think having metrics based on that would also be helpful. And um, I also um, ag agree with the comments of Mr. Thomas. So is the desire of the committee um, that, and thank you Ms. Rowe, is the desire of the committee that um, the process began in May and then instead of July include June uh, and that the date in subsection C remain unchanged? That's what it sounds like the desire is. And again, um, committee, correct me if that's an incorrect. Um, statement. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thomas, I see your name there. Did you have another comment or question? Yes. Uh, my only, uh, my last question would be that this is an evaluation of the board as a as a whole. Yes. Would there, could there also be an evaluation of board members on, on the board and their time on the board as well? I don't. Maybe that would. Maybe that reflect. Maybe that's too much reflection on the time, and it wouldn't necessarily be necessary. But maybe somewhere include like rate your own performance in the past year. Like, how do you believe that you have been an active member on the board? Um, have some type of reflection for individual member participation, and that might have been encompassed in the ten uh, suggestion. The ten, well, not necessarily really. I, I don't, I don't think. In that that, I yeah. don't see it necessarily in those ten. So. Um, and I am not uh, an evaluator, not an individual who creates those sorts of instruments. Sure. Uh, and your board council is has been recommended as the individual who will be your facilitator. But I would think that um, that part and parcel of determining uh, whether or not you're working well as a group is also determining whether or not you're contributing to the group. Maybe that's too self-evident, but if the, the board believes that needs to be added or committee believes that needs to be added, you know, your own effort, that's what sometimes is asked in academic courses. My effort in this course was, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't show up for class. So does that mean that I have contributed in a way that also allowed me to learn? I would assume that taking that concept, does it mean that because I haven't been at these board meetings or uh, because, you know, fill in the blank that I haven't been as reflective as I could have. I would think that is not necessarily something that board members would discuss with each other, but something that's part of your own self reflect self reflection and evaluation of your own board service. I don't think that's a discussion yeah. the board will be having as a as a group because that could look too. Um, that could look uh, too personal, I would think. I agree. Yeah, I don't think it should be something that the board discusses as a group, but I guess an exercise for individual board members uh, to do and for the exiting student member of the board to do since they would complete this at the end of their term and maybe reflect on that. So th mm. that's my thoughts. Thank you for that, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Colsey? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, for bringing that up. Um, I certainly thought that there was a personal board um, element in those 10 items. So for instance, attendance at board meetings, attendance at community um, events or meetings, um, legislative efforts uh, in terms of um, one of the things that's important is for the board to advocate for funding because we don't have the authority to tax or raise our own funds. So um, there are efforts that are put in um, by the board as a whole with the work that we do in the meetings and approving budgets and uh, resolutions and other um, areas of communicating what the board sees as a priority for funding. But then there's also other activities um, where board members go to county council meetings, go to legislative sessions in Annapolis. So um, I think it should be a combination of personal reflection because then that all adds up to the full board's 
activity and um, achievement? Or was it sufficient activity? Was it appropriate activity? Was it effective? Um, so that there would be some element of adding up those individual um, activities and achievements in coming up with the board's impact as a whole. Mm, thank you. Um, and I would also ask the things that we're adding. Um, Ms. Howie, you're um, at you. So what you're doing is putting all this together and then um, I guess I'm going to see is that the consensus of the committee that was how we put the, this together and then represented to us. Um, so I guess the easiest thing would be is there are there any objections to that or. OK. Did you have any uh, questions Ms. Howie or need? No, ma'am. OK. Right. Did so, any other? Sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. I was just asking if any other board members had any other comments or questions. Because I do recognize. Um, I want to make sure that we are able to get everything in. OK. Right, so I'll return so with I, um, with changes to uh, your self evaluation policy. Great. So our next item is item um, three, unfinished business policy 8350 council. And again, that's Ms. Howie. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, as you recall, we were discussing, or the committee was discussing 8350 uh, when you adjourned at the um, last meeting. So this is being returned to you. So let me just refresh your recollection. Um, there was um, a public works recommendation about board council that board council uh, be required to earn a professional registered parliamentarian credential. Those are issued um, by the and granted rather by the National Association of Parliamentarians. But I would remind you that your recent request for proposal did not include that requirement, simply that the individual um, be a member of NAP or its equivalents, which equivalency, which would be AIP, the American Institute of Parliamentarians. So uh, just so you're aware that that was uh, referenced in the Public Works um, review. So the, the change we recommended that were that was brought forward to you at your last meeting was very simple. It was that your uh, policy reflect what was also in your board handbook. And that is simply uh, to state that the board council serves as your parliamentarian. That was the only change that was recommended. Prior to our adjournment, um, Ms. Causey did present uh, a motion in the chat that basically mirrored the language that is in the Washington County uh, Board of Education policy about um, its council. Um, so uh, I did provide to members of the committee um, information about um, what uh, the school systems office of law does as opposed to board council and also as you're aware there are four words uh, in um, in section 4104 of the education article which addresses um, council that can be retained by a local board uh, in maryland and those four words are except in baltimore county so only um, in Baltimore County is do you lack the authority to directly hire um, as the board uh, your own counsel. And again, just a bit of history. Um, until the early 2000s, there was an assistant county attorney assigned to the Board of Education, and that assistant county attorney uh, was counsel to the board. And when that assignment ended, uh, there was um, a different arrangement that was made. The current uh, county attorney um, has indicated that, I mean, it's what the law states. So the current county, the current county attorney uh, is the individual through, uh, through which board council uh, has to be obtained. Um, so just to make sure that that refinement was clear to the committee uh, as you make your decisions about what language you would like in um, in this policy. 
and there is in the analysis the specific language recommended by Ms. Causey, which is um, from the Washington County Board policy. Washington County being a board uh, that has the authority to hire outside counsel. Uh, they also have in-house counsel. They have two in-house attorneys and I believe a paralegal. Okay, thank you for that. Um, are there any questions or comments? Ms. Rowe? Sorry, I don't know who was first, Ms. Rowe or Ms. Causey. I think Ms. Rowe. <laughs> so, Ms. Howie. Yes, ma'am. To our policy right now, Mm -hmm. and the RFP that the county did for our current board council. What is the requirement that the current board council has to meet for parliamentarian um, expertise, if you will? So the RFP simply said they have to be a member of NAP. And in order to uh, gain membership to NAP, you are required to take a membership exam. Um, which is, you know, fairly elementary. Um, AIP does not have a similar requirement. Uh, you can simply, I think it's $50 to be a member of AIP. So there's no so test. So we are requiring some sort of an exam. Um, if you are requiring that they be members of NAP, that is not what the RFP indicated, however. The RFP indicates NAP, National Association, of parliamentarians or equivalency. Do we have the authority in our policy since we can't hire our own counsel to put in our policy what our accreditation expectations are or are we limited in that way? Well, um, the concern I would have about putting that requirement in your policy is that it wasn't in the RFP and there are a lot of people who serve as parliamentarians who do not have a credential, quite a lot. Frighteningly so, actually. Uh, my concern <laughs> is that I don't believe the county, even moving forward, is going to put anything in the RFP that's not in our policy. And so we're caught in this sort of loop where it's not in the policy, so it's not in the RFP, and then it's not in the RFP, so we can't put it in the policy. And we are the 24th largest school system in the country. We need an effective parliamentarian. And if there's anything that I have seen serving on this board that is lacking, is that the board council often defers to the school system council to be the parliamentarian, even though our policy and handbook say the board council is supposed to be the parliamentarian. No so it seems, well, I mean, our school system council is a very effective and thorough parliamentarian, but, you know, the order of things matters. And if our expectation is that the board council be the parliamentarian, I think it's important that the board council have the appropriate training. And I've been somewhat underwhelmed. Again, no comment, um, but I will say that your RFP did indicate that individuals had to be members of NAP or its equivalency. And right now, the only other game in town is AIP, the American Institute of Parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. So in order to be a member of AIP, one simply needs to pay a membership fee. You do not need to take a qualifying exam. So that clarification. Can we specify NAP in our policy? So if you specify, here, here's the, 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 the quandary that you run into, Ms. Rowe. If you specify that in your policy and yet you have not um, indicated in the RFP that that is what you want, then you're hiring someone or have already indicated that it's acceptable for there to be that, that level of, uh, of membership that does not involve a credential. So if this is aspirational, however, if this is what you are expecting from future board council or for board council to retain, uh, that's another question. Uh, were I flipping the script, as the kids say, I would indicate that the board's policy itself, while that's all fine, well and good, this is not how I was uh, hired and this is not this is not what was in the RFP. So. The question becomes, um, 
how do you enforce it? You would so, need a county attorney to enforce it. Okay, and we so, we need to we need to move on. There's other board members there, that have questions because we don't we, at this rate we'll be here all night. Um, it looks like there's a question from Ms. Causey. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. So um, I was just going to make a suggestion um, to Ms. Howie and Board Member Rowe. Is it? I've seen this in policies before where we approve a policy, but we make an effective date for somewhere in the future so that it doesn't impact uh, the situation currently. So that's one suggestion. And maybe we just implement that um, paragraph at the future date that aligns with the current contract that we just got approved by the county government. Um, the other thing I was going to say in terms of the language of um, my motion is that it says that the board will utilize council, but right. it doesn't say how it procures it. And so maybe what we need is an acknowledgement in the policy that current law requires the board's council to be um, hired or procured by the county attorney, which would actually have been helpful to know um, a little bit earlier. So those are those are two two points that I would make. And just so you know, Ms. Causey, uh, with respect to some of what uh, you indicate um, that board council will be utilized for, is currently done by the um, the office of law, the the school systems office of law. So, for example, um, what uh, what we do are the Maryland State Board of Ed um, appeals, uh, so that we are able to reduce costs and there's no conflict of interest because uh, the school system is the client um, as opposed to the board during your hearings when you're listening to the school system's appeals. Uh, so if the board, however, wishes to go in a different direction, and I mean, that's the board's pleasure, and wishes to be able to um, outsource some of the things that are done in-house, um, that wasn't entirely clear from the language that was recommended. Thank that you. is very helpful, thank you. Um, well, I would just ask, like we've done with some of the other policies uh, for staff, if there's consensus on the board to understand the spirit of the request and mm -hmm. provide language that um, you feel is appropriate. So for clarification, um, are you all, um, uh, Ms. Howie, adding language based on the recommendations from the committee and then presenting this back to us or is this? I'm not entirely clear on uh, what the committee would like. Um, Ms. Ms. Causey did indicate that she wanted a future effective date for any possible credentialing. Um, Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Rowe indicated that she also wanted some requirement about credentialing and I would presume that that would also go to some future date. Um, so those two I understand if is there something more that the committee wish to see in this policy uh I outside of the credentialing I didn't hear additional um requests but um if there are committee members can state so okay so if not then um would you be adding that and then represent well presenting it to us again okay no problem, members of the committee. Um, so just yeah. two uh, brief updates uh, for the committee. The first, um, to make sure that you had the additional dates um, that we were suggesting for another meeting, either in May or June. Um, so uh, based on Ms. Um, Ms. Gover's review of your calendar, uh, three possibilities are May 23rd, June 20th, uh, or June 27th. So those are the possibilities. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Ms. Howie. I, I yes. apologize. I'm looking um, at my script. It looks like there was a public works operation. Oh, I do apologize. I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead of myself. 
<laughs> so, um, members of the committee, just a very brief update. Uh, I did provide uh, a memo that is has been uploaded to board docs um, to give you um, an update about what has been done um, on those PRC related recommendations. I also sent an email to members of the committee on the 9th uh, to uh, further to you know explain to you what we've done with the policy website. So the specific recommendation from um, Public Works was that uh, BCPS create a user friendly subject index with word search capability. Uh, and then they provided an exemplar, which is Broward County, um, as um, as an example of something that the school system, something that BCPS should follow. Um, we have met with the board doc staff, and we also uh, looked at the Broward County example uh, and looked a little bit deeper at what uh, board what uh, PRC was recommending and the reason for it. And the reason for the recommendation was that they did not believe, at least it was not expressed, that uh, it was easy to find things, find policies or rules on our website. So I believe that what staff has done has been um, directly responsive to that without um, implementing an index. Specifically, as I indicated to you, as I communicated, we changed the website to now include a feature. On that feature, policies and rules are highlighted once one comes to the board docs page. When you click on board policies, you'll go to a board policy table of contents. Similarly, when you click board superintendent's rules, the superintendent's rule table of contents. And then there are hyperlinks in the list uh, in the table of contents. I will say that uh, the board doc staff thought that an index was counterproductive and thought that it was actually more work that would not net the same sort of transparency. So they've also recommended that we consider a keyword search. So we will be uh, moving forward on a possible keyword search. The other thing that was recommended was that there be explicit directions on the website for how to find policies and rules. And we've done that, we've done an FAQ. So we believe we've responded to that particular recommendation. As well, um, you have in the memo um, a chart, because I'm kind of visual, of what we've done for the tier one policy recommendations. The only one that remains is number 1-12, is, is updating the self-assessment instrument. So we had started to deal with that tonight. We will uh, obviously um, continue. And just so that you can show uh, members of the public how aware you are of the history of the school system, if you look at the memo that was provided to you, you'll see there were blue arrows and yellow arrows. That's because back when we had actual binders with board policies and superintendent's rules, board policies were always on blue paper, superintendent's rules always on yellow paper. So. Uh, you can do a survey of the community and see how many people remember that. <laughs> so that is that ends the report for um, updating you on the status of our responses to public works recommendations. Great, thank you, Ms. Stanley. And um, the next part, uh, the next um, item would be additional meeting dates, which you had spoken about. Um, yes, I apologize. I jumped sure. forward. Oh, um, excuse me. It looks like there's a comment from Ms. Causey. Apologies. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Howie, I have blue paper in my house because I print <laughs> policies on blue paper. Uh, so, um, thank you for that presentation. It's very helpful. And like I pointed out in the other meeting, um, kudos to staff for getting that done. Um, I've already been able to use it. It's, it's. Uh, I think it's very functional. Um, I did. If we had one minute, uh, there is a tier two recommendation um, appendix G3 of the public works and it's 1-10 uh, which I believe you referenced um, with the board materials but it has an additional um, at the end it speaks to ensuring the board training funds 
are not transferred for other expenses. Mm -hmm. um, and in the policy 8350 that we just um, finished discussing and the staff is going to make recommendations and bring it back, um, there are other districts that have phrases in their policy um, that say funds for board legal fees shall be included in the annual budget. So mm -hmm. it's in the annual budget, not, um, and so it's specifically not in the board operating um, or board office budget uh, so that uh, there wouldn't be any um, commingling or you know disruption of the training funds, which would be separate. So I just wanted to put that out there for consideration um, and say I appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank you. And Ms. Hallie, you were speaking now about the additional meeting dates. Yes, there are three possible additional meeting dates. Um, if the committee wants to um, want staff to poll the committee to determine which date uh, the largest number of members uh, can be present, we can do that. But we wanted to make sure you had those dates, given that that was what we indicated last month. Okay. Um, and uh, again, uh, could you um, remind us what are the dates? Sure. May 23rd, 2022, June 20th, 2022, and June 27th. Uh, so Ms. Uh, Gover was very helpful. Um, she indicated commencements began on May 24th. She thought May 23rd would therefore not conflict with mm -hmm. the upcoming commencement schedule. Um, my, June 20th, audit and budget do meet those week that week, uh, but there's uh, there's not a member of PRC who's also a member of either audit or budget. And then finally, uh, for June 27th, uh, that may be a challenge because that is the, the after the end of the school year for our students. So we may have staff who have already um, already decided to take vacation. So do we need to make the decision the decision now or was there an email sent out like a um i guess a survey that we would we all did not send a survey out uh we simply indicated we would come back to you with dates okay um how, how would the committee feel with uh having a, maybe a survey sent out and then um committee members could put in what date worked best for them um would there be any objections to that or how would um what does everyone feel about that Uh, Ms. Causey, we did not look at April. No, ma'am. Um, would that be out of the realm to look at April? I can certainly ask uh, Ms. Uh, Gover, but these were the dates that she thought were most workable. Okay, so I think that would be best because I, I hear it, but also I think um, having a survey sent out and having something visual where members could put in what date works best for them. Mm -hmm. Seems like that would be um, uh, the best way to go. Are there any objections to that or? Um, no objections. That sounds good. OK, great. No objections right. from me either, uh, but I just wanted to say that this might be yeah. my last meeting if we or my last board meeting if it's on June 20th or June 27th. Um, so I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Christian. <laughs> So, yeah, so I, I think that would be the best way to go. Put that in. We could have that and then people can put it. <laughs> Chris is making me laugh. <laughs> put in what works best for them. We will do that. Thank you. OK, thank you, members of the committee. That's all I have for this evening. OK, so the floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss you know, any issues of concern. Um, but again, as always, I have to emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Meetings Act. So the floor is open. Are there any issues of concern? Sorry, I was muted. OK. So hearing none, our, uh, the next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for February 14th. That'd be 2022. God bless you. Thought I heard a sneeze. Ms. Um, Ms. Scott, you're on mute. Oh, 
Because <clears throat> I did sneeze. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I was coughing. OK. So our next meeting is scheduled for <clears throat> February 14th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Oh, I apologize, I'm coughing. So because there's no further business, it looks like the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all so much, and I hope everyone has a, um, a great holiday. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Have a good night. Enjoy your evening.